Okay, chapter five is on purchasing, receiving, and storage. And with this one, we do go right into watching a DVD. So hang on and we'll be right back. People come to poetry because we've got a certain reputation. People think we're one of the most romantic spots in town. And I'm not going to argue with that at all. This is the place, you know, that you go to for that special evening. Soft lights, wonderful food, music that's just right. Poetry's got a rhythm all its own. Sure, not everyone here has romance on their minds. We get business people and families here too. And just between you and me, sometimes people come to poetry just because they're hungry. But whatever their rhymes or reasons, they've all come here for an experience they really can't get anywhere else. Because frankly, we try to spoil every one of our customers. So we work really hard to make sure everything goes just right for everyone's special evening, no matter what it is. And it all starts well before the evening begins. And I'm not talking about the atmosphere or the mood, but the food. It's not enough that the food is merely wonderful, which it is, but the food has to be safe. And your responsibility for the safety of the food in your establishment begins long before any food is actually served to the customer. Your responsibilities actually begin with your purchasing, receiving, and storage procedures. Here's what you need to know. How to prevent cross-contamination. The proper procedures for time and temperature control. General purchasing and receiving principles. General guidelines for receiving and inspecting food and general storage guidelines. The safety of the food at your establishment will depend largely on how well you apply food safety practices throughout the flow of food. The flow begins with purchasing and receiving and goes all the way through storing, preparing, cooking, holding, cooling, reheating, and serving. To keep food safe, it is important to prevent cross-contamination and time and temperature abuse throughout the entire flow of food in your establishment. Let me spell it out. Cross-contamination is the transfer of microorganisms from one food or surface to another. And it can happen almost anywhere in your operation. But once you know how and where these microorganisms can be transferred, cross-contamination is pretty simple to prevent. For starters, you may want to designate specific cutting boards and utensils for raw food, while at the same time designating a different set for ready-to-eat food. Now, although this practice minimizes the risk of cross-contamination, it doesn't eliminate the need for proper cleaning and sanitizing practices. You should clean and sanitize all your work surfaces, equipment, and utensils after each and every task. And if you have only a single prep table, you have to prepare raw meat, fish, poultry, and ready-to-eat food at different times. Another factor responsible for foodborne illness outbreaks is time and temperature abuse. Foodborne pathogens grow at temperatures between 41 and 135 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 and 57 Celsius. When food is in this range, it's in the temperature danger zone. Remember, that whenever food is held in the temperature danger zone, it's being abused and you could have problems. Besides temperature, time also plays a critical role in food safety. That's because foodborne microorganisms that can cause illness need both time and the proper temperature to grow. The longer food stays in the temperature danger zone, the more time pathogens have to grow and make food unsafe so you should always minimize the time food spends in the temperature danger zone. If food is held in this dangerous range for four hours or more, you've got to throw it out. When you purchase food products, 
you should always start by buying only from suppliers who get their products from approved sources. And that approved food source is one that has been inspected and is in compliance with applicable local, state, and federal law. Don't accept any product from an unapproved source. You literally don't know what you'll be getting. Now, when it comes to receiving the products you've purchased, you have to make sure your employees have enough time to thoroughly check everything. So you should schedule deliveries for off-peak hours and only receive one delivery at a time. And this is very important. Your receiving staff should have the authority to accept, reject, and sign for deliveries. You've gone through a lot of trouble to purchase the best quality products you can get. So make sure you're getting what you're paying for. All deliveries need to be inspected immediately and the items should be put away as quickly as possible. This is especially true for refrigerated and frozen products. Now, if the inspection turns up a product that should be rejected, here's what to do. That item should be set aside. Then they need to tell the delivery person exactly what's wrong with the product but make sure they get a signed adjustment or credit slip from the delivery person before the rejected product is thrown out or given back to the delivery person. Then they should log the incident on the invoice or the receiving document. There are general criteria that you should follow when receiving food. Let's start with temperature. Cold TCS food should be received at 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 Celsius or lower, unless otherwise specified while hot TCS food should be 135 degrees Fahrenheit, 57 Celsius or higher. Make sure frozen food is frozen when you receive it. You should always check to see if the product has thawed and been refrozen. Look for things like fluids or frozen liquids in the bottoms of cases or ice crystals on the product or packaging. Water stains on the package are another sign. There are other things to look for when it comes to packaging. The packaging of food and non-food items should be intact, clean, and should protect food and food contact surfaces from contamination. You should reject items with tears, holes, or punctures in their packaging. The same goes for items with dirty wrappers or with broken cartons or seals. Any package that is damp or leaking should be rejected. If there is a water stain on the package, you'll also want to reject it since this means it was wet at some point. Always check the code or use-by date on the package. If it is expired, reject it. And this really goes without saying. Reject any item that shows signs of pests or pest damage. Cans have their own set of criteria. Reject those with swollen ends, rust, or dents. Finally, when inspecting food, you'll want to check quality. Poor food quality can be a sign that the food has been time temperature abused and may be unsafe. You should work with your suppliers to define specific safety and quality criteria for the products you typically receive. You have to look at color, texture, and smell. That can tell you a lot about the product that you have purchased. Food should be rejected if it has an abnormal color or odor. Texture is also important, especially when it comes to meat, fish, and poultry. These items should be rejected if they are slimy, sticky, or dry. The same goes if the flesh is soft and leaves an imprint when you touch it. You also need to check certain products to make sure they have an inspection stamp. This is one way to make sure they are coming from an approved source. Meat and poultry must have a USDA or a State Department of Agriculture inspection stamp. This stamp indicates that the product and the processing plant have met certain standards. Egg products must have an inspection stamp indicating that federal regulations have been enforced to maintain quality and reduce contamination. In addition to these guidelines, you should always reject any item that does not meet your company's standards for quality. But receiving is only half the story. Storage has its own set of concerns because poor storage practices can really ruin the rhythm of your operation. You should set up some general storage guidelines and have your staff put them into practice. You need to clear a space in storage for new products. 
and you want to make sure everything already in storage is properly labeled. All TCS ready-to-eat food prepped in-house that will be held for longer than 24 hours must be labeled. The label should include the name of the food and the date by which it should be sold, consumed, or discarded. Once food has been properly labeled, you have to arrange products to make sure that the oldest inventory is used first. This method is used in refrigerated, frozen, and dry storage, and it's called first in, first out. Be sure to discard any food items that have passed their use-by date or manufacturer's expiration date. And remember that any food that needs time and temperature control for safety that was prepared on site can only be stored for a total of seven days at 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 Celsius or lower. After seven days, it has to be thrown out. Food should only be stored in containers that are intended for food. Make sure they're durable, leak-proof, and that you're able to seal or cover them. And always clean and sanitize the container before storing food in it. And here's a major red flag. You should never put food in empty chemical containers or use empty food containers to store chemicals. Now here's the thing about storing newly received refrigerated and frozen food, or any food that needs time and temperature control for safety. You have to keep them out of the temperature danger zone by storing them as soon as they've been inspected. And make sure you only store food in designated storage areas. Cleanliness is a real issue with your designated storage areas. The floors, walls, and shelving in refrigerators, freezers, dry storerooms, and heated holding cabinets have to be cleaned on a regular basis. Make it a rule to clean up leaks and spills right away to keep them from contaminating other foods and providing food for pests. And get into the routine of checking the temperature of stored foods regularly. Randomly sample the internal temperature of refrigerated food to ensure that the temperature is 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 Celsius, or lower. Check frozen products to make sure that they're frozen. Proper storage practices also means that you don't overload refrigerators and freezers. Storing too many products prevents good airflow and makes the unit work harder to stay cold. Refrigerator and freezer doors should also be kept closed as much as possible. Frequent opening lets warm air inside which can affect food safety and make units work harder. If raw meat, poultry, and fish can't be stored by themselves, make sure you store cooked and ready-to-eat food above these items. This will prevent raw product juices from dripping onto the prepared food and causing a foodborne illness. Raw meat, poultry, and fish have to be stored in the following top-to-bottom order in refrigerators. Whole fish, whole cuts of beef and pork, ground meats and fish, whole and ground poultry. This order is based upon the minimum internal cooking temperature of each food. You have to pay just as much attention to the guidelines for placing food in dry storage. Your dry storerooms need to be kept cool and dry because heat and moisture are the biggest dangers to dry and canned foods. To assure the safety of your dry food and to maintain optimum quality, keep the temperature of the storeroom between 50 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 and 21 Celsius. Your storeroom should also be well ventilated. This will help keep the temperature and humidity constant throughout the storage area. Your dry food has to be stored away from walls and at least six inches, 15 centimeters, off the floor. And it should never be stored near chemicals or cleaning supplies. You also need to keep dry food out of direct sunlight. And above all, keep the area clean. Well, even in a romantic spot like this, I'll admit, there's nothing romantic about purchasing, receiving, and storing. But directly or indirectly, everything that happens in the back of the house eventually has an impact on the front of the house. And you know, nothing, and I mean nothing, can ruin a special evening faster than a foodborne illness. And if good practices can help keep that special rhythm we have here at Poetry, then I'm all for it.